welcome friends to this afternoon session of our second day in this work, meditation workshop in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. I'm happy to see you again. We have talked about meditation and sometimes people think it has to be taken very seriously. I don't believe that. Life should not be taken seriously, then how can meditation be taken seriously? If you take life as it is, from the point of view of our true home from where we came, that we came for adventure. We came for temporary adventure and then we go back home. Like we go to a carnival. We go to carnival, we see all the rides, ups and downs, and then we go home. We don't try to say that now this wheel, where is wheel I like very much, I am going to buy it and keep it with me. But here we are trying to buy things and keep those things as if they really belong to us. Nothing has ever belonged to anybody. We always leave it behind, everything. But we spend so much time possessing things. This is my car, my house, my property, bought a new chair. And these are the things which we try to possess so much and collect so much that draws us back again and again. Okay, take care of your things. You are dead. Oh, I got my thing there. Okay, go back and take care of your things. Take care of the people. Nobody has ever taken anything or any person with him or her, ever. We all die, masters included, perfect living masters included. No exception whatsoever till today. And why are we spending so much time and attention and energy in collecting things which will never go with us? We are only going to create a problem at the end. All these things we get are for our use while we are here. And we don't take them as given to us for use. We think we can take them, some of them with us, maybe. Or that we will never die, others will die. I see people attending funerals of other people and no thought that they will also have to go. They live forever. Where is this thought coming that you will live forever? This thought is not coming, it's not a thought. It's an intuition. It's intuition that says you will never die, but the body dies, we think we have died. Intuition is speaking about the soul. The soul never dies. But the body goes. And these possessions that we collect so much, I look at my own house and I see so much stuff put there. Oh, we will use it one day and the day never comes. There was a friend of mine and he used to come to my program regularly. One day he wrote to me, sorry this time I cannot come because I loved a chair so beautifully, $850 chair. I didn't have the money, so I put in a down payment for a layover. Layover means they, when I complete the payments, I can pick up the chair. Sorry I did not come to you because the money that I kept to come to you has been put on the layover deposit for the chair. The next program he wrote to me, I had to put a second installment. Sorry I could not come and see you. When the third installment had to be paid to pick the chair, he died before he got the chair. Imagine his state. He has invested in a chair he never got. Now it's impossible to prevent his coming back just for one chair. That is how we get attached to things and we miss things and we have to come back for that. So if we want to treat life as it is, we say, life we came for adventure, we have been given some things, given friends, family, people, all for association with us, being used by us, enjoyed by us while we are here. They won't go with us anywhere. 
So that is why he creates this feeling and then when we get so attached to things, if we lose them, we are miserable. Oh, I'm very sorry I lost this. Oh, I lost the thief came and robbed me. Terrible. Oh, my son died. I am in great shock. Oh, so and so went away. When you make your life miserable, thinking that this is this is the only life, this is the only reality, we are making an opportunity for adventure and fun into a miserable life of ours. With a simple thing. Simply not realizing we are here temporarily. And that's the truth for every one of us. That we are here temporarily. Why are we investing so much in something that makes this life here miserable and makes us come back again for more misery by attachments to these things. So that is why it's very important. Keep this in mind. Nothing is ours. Nothing will stay with us. You have probably heard the story of King Janak who was a very great seeker in India and he wanted instant knowledge. So he asked his ministers and others that I want to get some instant spiritual knowledge of reality. What is real? I want to know. So the ministers and advisors in his government said you are a very lucky man Majesty King Janak, because you are living in a country, India, full of people with knowledge of that kind. There are so many yogis, swamis all over the country. Just have a little feast and make it a holy feast by calling it like a ceremony. Burn some fire, put some other things, incense into that, become a holy feast. But people who have knowledge will come and then you can get all the knowledge you want from them. So he held a big holy feast in his palace and put up some tents and the yogi swamis, many came, some in saffron colored robes, some in white colored robes, some in black colored robes, some in no robes. They all gathered there <laughs> and the king disguised himself as a common tourist so that he, nobody should know I am the king. And he walked there in, in their midst to find out what knowledge they have. He was surprised and shocked that these people who thought that they are enlightened were all full of knowledge from the books which they kept with them. And they argued with each other, the interpretation of the books. The same book two people are holding, they say, no, that's not what the meaning of this verse, that's not the meaning. Some are coming to blows over this with anger. He said, these people may be very learned from books, but I don't see any enlightenment in them. I don't see any knowledge that I need. I need true knowledge, not book knowledge. He got very disappointed. He came back to the palace and told his advisors, sorry, there is no knowledge with these people. They are learning, but not knowledge. They are very learned. They can recite the books by heart. But that is not knowledge. I want to know the truth about oneself. Who is the self? Who are we? Why are we here? I want real answers. They said, the advisors said, King Janak, these are people from a local area. The country is big. You should invite them for a longer period from all over the country. So by beat of drum, the message was sent all over the country. And the king is having a seven-day feast, not one-day feast. So more people came, huge crowd. And the king again disguised himself and every day moved amongst those people and saw the same show repeated again. All very learned people, all who could quote the scriptures by heart. But none of them had true knowledge. Then he came back disappointed. Then his advisor said, King, what you are looking for may not be available with these people, but the one who will have this knowledge will not come to a feast like this. He said, is there such a one? They said, yes, there is one perfect living master. 
He lives on the bank of the river in a small hut. And he can give you true knowledge. He doesn't come to these feasts. King said, why didn't you tell me first? I'll go and invite him now. So the king went and the name of the mystic who lived on the bank of the river was Ashtabakar. Ashtabakar, Ashtabakar means eight. Bakar means the bends. He had a hunchback with eight bends on his back. His body was deformed from birth. So when the king went and saw Ashtabakar, he begged him. Ashtabakar got up, king, what are you doing? He said, I have not come as a king. I have come as a beggar, a beggar of knowledge. I understand you can give true knowledge and I want to invite you to come to my palace and share true knowledge with me and my colleagues and my other people in my court and also those neighboring kings and others, I will invite them. He said, King, you come yourself, I will certainly come to your palace. Date and time was fixed. The king invited all nobility, all royalty around him from neighboring countries. They all assembled in a big auditorium. Ashtabhaka arrived accompanied by seven or eight of his disciples. And they all took off their shoes, which are customary at the entrance. And as Ashtabhaka walked, the people in the audience saw a hunchback man walking in, what kind of guy has the king invited to give knowledge? What can this man give us? Look at him first. So by the time he reached the stage, king had put two chairs, one for himself and one for the master. Ashtabhaka sat there and he said, King, what is the price of leather today? The king said, Master, I invited you to tell us about knowledge. What has leather to do with it? He said, are they not all leather merchants sitting here? He said, no, master, they are all royalty and nobility sitting here, which is hoping to get some knowledge from your talk. He said, oh, the way they looked at my skin, I thought they may be dealing with some leather. <laughs> then the audience realized that this guy has some sense of humor. So they became a little more patient. Then Ashtabhakar said, king, what kind of knowledge do you want? He said, I want instant knowledge. By the way, when I hear this story, I think the king was an American in his past life. <laughs> instant knowledge, instant coffee, everything instant. The Ashtabhaka said, there is a price to pay. To pay, to get instant knowledge, you have to pay a price. He said, any price, you just quote the price, it will be yours. All my coffers, all my wealth is open to you. Just tell me how much. He said, I want three things. King said, you can take 10, 20, any number. Why confine to three? The only three things I want. I want your body. I want your wealth. And I want your mind. Give me these three, I'll give you instant knowledge. This was a strange price tag. But the king was a great seeker. He said, I agree. All these are yours. My body is yours at your disposal. All my wealth is yours. And even my mind is yours. Ashtabhakar said, Are you sure you've given this to me? He said, Sure, Master, I have surrendered all these three to you. Ashtabhakar said, If this body has been given to me, will you please pick up this body and place it on the shoes which I left at the door when I walked in? King realized that I have given the body, I have to now do what he tells me. So he got up as he's walking toward the shoes. The whole audience is murmurs, what foolish stuff we have come to. This kind of knowledge to ask the king to sit on the shoes, is it some kind of knowledge being given? It's terrible. So the king, while walking, thought, these people don't know what I'm seeking for. They think, because of I have so much wealth and so much this thing, why am I sitting on the shoes? When this thought came to him, Ashtabhaka shouted from the stage, King, you have no business to think of that wealth. It's no longer yours. Suddenly the king realized, my wealth is not mine. I've given it to Ashtabhaka. 
how could i how could i think this is mine as this thought was crossing his mind ashtabhakar shouted again king you can't even think about anything because you given your mind to me and ashtabhakar suddenly said such a loud voice the king had no option he put his hands on top of his head like this he can't even think and at that time when he was like this he got enlightened and Mr. Bunker said, "Can you get come back? Don't have to sit on the shoes." And he came back. He said, "Sit down." Can you tell me, did you get instant knowledge? Yes, master, I got. Any doubt? No doubt. The way it was given to me, no doubt. He said, "It's something that I knew about me. It's great. You made me discover myself. It's not here." Thank you, master. He said. Ashtabhakar said, "King, I do not need your body. Look at my crumpled body. I am trying to take care of one. I don't need another. I don't need your wealth. It's of no use to me. And certainly, I don't need your mind. I have problem with my own. <laughs> But only remember one thing: that I am giving them back to you to use, and not ever consider their yours." Consider that this body is got, belongs to the master. Consider all wealth belongs to the master. Consider your mind belongs to the master, and then, in the course of some years, you will get this enlightenment which you got just in one second, once again. This is a old story that we are told, and the whole thing is the lesson in it is, we don't have to wait for the master to invite us and be told what to do. we know if we from today start thinking this body belongs to the master all our wealth thought possessions belong to the master given to us for use while we are here even our mind has been given to use to meditate to think the way we the soul wants to think in order to take it back if all these three belong to master we are just using them for life will change today so many things we are doing we will never do again so that is why this is a very good story that how we should live life nothing belongs to us because truly doesn't it has to be left behind but where our attachments are there if we think it belongs to somebody else it cut down lot of attachments therefore it's a good story now i want to touch upon another subject connected with this and that is what is the role of seva service in the spiritual path seva is to off an offering to the master of something that you feel the master may need or you are donating for some reason and not thinking of any reward for that if you give seva i will give seva i'll get more back that's not seva seva is of three kinds a great master used to explain seva of the body seva of wealth seva of the mind people have well understood the seva of the wealth send a check put some donation in the donation box the seva of wealth is easy seva of body is little more difficult because we think we can't always serve the master with our physical body is not available we are so many of us following a master therefore we try to do the seva of the body through what can be done in the interest of what the master wants us to do in the dera in india great masters time we used to do what we call mitti seva seva with dirt seva with mud there it as it happens they were building the dera buildings and it was a good opportunity for all of us to participate so by participating in seva it was a bodily seva we were doing and it had the same value as seva by sending a check third seva is the most difficult seva of the mind what is seva of the mind seva of the mind is when you meditate with the mind make it an offering to the master 
and not for your own self. When you are meditating for your own self, you do not save up. If you say, today, Master, I am going to donate two hours of my meditation to you, that save off the mind. You will find a huge distinction between meditation for your own sake and meditation as seva service to the master. So that is called seva of the mind. The seva of the mind has the greatest value compared to all these three. Seva of the mind is where we meditate and offer to the master. That's a, it's a big thing and not emphasized too much. Most of us are meditating to get something for ourselves. If we can give in seva some part of our wealth, like we say tithes are given, one tenth of income is given to a charity, we can do some bodily seva, volunteer work. How many are doing seva of the mind? Which is more significant than better? Therefore, every now and then do some meditation seva for the mind. In fact, if you don't mind, you can do all meditation, seva to the master, and get more benefit than merely doing seva for yourself by meditating to get something. So therefore, it's a great experience to have the experience of master and say, master, I offer you this seva in meditation, offer today's meditation, my simran, my listening to sound is not for me, but offering to you. I don't know how many of you have done meditation like that. Anybody ever done meditation as seva? Very good. Let's all do it. Now, are you ready? Let's do some session of meditation purely as seva for the master. As an offering to the master. With, without expecting a reward. That's the key. If you expect a reward, it's not seva, it's a tra business transaction. So therefore, do seva as an offering as, as offering to your masters. And see the master, place your seva and sit for seva, do your simran, do your repetition, listen to the sound, whatever you can do. Keep the dhyan, the image of the master, and that seva will count as seva of the mind. So close your eyes, go back to the meditation center once again and start this unique seva of the mind.
keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Welcome back. How many of you successfully did savor of the mind during this session? See that. See that. How much savor should one do? Should we devote our entire life, our entire wealth, our entire mind to only savor? Or is there a right proportion? of how much we should do. The answer is given in terms of what our karmic obligations are. We are here in this world because of our karma. Every moment of our life, what passes as an event is based on karma. Every moment of our life, something happens to us is karma. Karma is a continuous process. If karma stops, we will be dead. Life in the physical body, in the physical form, is only governed by the law of karma. Therefore, what is karma? Karma is our own actions and intentions expressed in previous human lives, which has created our destiny. <coughs> we have created karma not only by action but by intention to act. When your mind intends to do something, even if it does not do it, karma is created. So you can see the power of your thought, power of your thinking, that you express your intentions all the time in your head, karma is being generated continuously. If you carry that whatever you are intending to do into action, physical action, it only adds to the karma and does not remove the karma. It adds to the karma, becomes a bigger karma. So the karma leads to a reaction of a payoff back in terms of reward and punishment. It's a basic system in which your actions are judged by you. At the end of your life, when people die, there is a flashback of their whole life that comes up right in front of them. When the flashback takes place, they say, oh, I did this, I did this, I forgot all about it, now I remember all of it. That flashback determines what you feel. You feel guilty, you feel happy, you feel the good thing is immediately developing into another life. Supposing you say, I am going to live a life in which new karma is the minimum. I only pay my old karma. It's very hard to do, but somebody takes a decision to live life without creating new karma. How can that be done? not expressing any intention to act. Going with the flow, like they used to say. When I first came to the United States, I heard this phrase everywhere. Go with the flow. I said, these are very enlightened people. They know how to live without creating karma. And they are just paying off their old karma. They are going with the flow. This means whatever happens around you, go with it. Don't change it, don't alter it, don't make new decisions, go with what is happening. The circumstances will create the whole life for you. It does for everybody. So we, supposing somebody says, I'll create no more karma, the karma can still be picked up from what you did before you decided. How much is that karma from where it can be picked up? Karma of millions of lives is all stored in your mind. And a new life can be made up merely from that, even if you pay off everything. 
which is very rare for people to try to live with live exactly according to circumstances, do what is circumstances tell them and not make their own decisions. Live what some people call living in the will of God. When somebody says, I want to live in the will of God, how do you live in the will of God? You do what circumstances tell you to do. Don't discuss, no, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that. That changes. Somebody asked a nice mystic, how can we know if the will of the God is not being expressed through our mind? Is a mind independent from God? The mind is also created by God. So if we take decisions by mind, that is also God's will. This question was put to Rumi Malana Rumi. He answered it briefly. He says, there is no difficulty knowing what is God's will. If he has put a spade in your hand, he has expressed his will, dig. If he has placed a pen in your hand, he has expressed his will, write. He has provided the circumstances around you throughout life to tell you what to do. That's God's will. Therefore, God himself has created the mind's will and the God's will, a spiritual will and a mental will, and it's stalled both in our heads. We can choose one or the other. Most of us are living our life with mental will. Constantly have to make decisions. Constantly have to decide what I should do, not do. All those are mental decisions and we don't go with spiritual will. The spiritual will can be exercised by us if we don't use the mind for that will. First thing is what is called go with the flow, the spiritual will. Secondly, if you are in control of your mind through meditation, then the intuitive knowledge should be your spiritual will. What you feel intuitively, do that. If you can't even discover what the intuition is, then check with your master. Master, what is your will? It can eat out. It's not your mental will. If you can't have access to the physical master, ask the master inside. Master, what's your will? And I've got choices. What's your will? Master will express his will to make sure that the mind doesn't become the master and take his form and give you his directions, which is a mental will. They repeat the holy words, the words of Simran, which are a safeguard for such occasions. Repeat those words, then seek the master's will. And you will be guided to develop your spiritual will. So that is why when karma is created, we create so many obligations to fulfill it. And there is no choice. Once a karma package is made, and the destiny for one life is created, it's already completely, completely written up, not part of it. Completely written up what will happen to you, what events will take place, when they will take place. So as life goes on and those events happen, you, you have to go through them. As I said yesterday, sometimes if they are too hard, the payback, master helps. But Master also reminds us, it's not somebody else imposing this on you. It's your own actions, your own intentions of the past life. At that time you forgot what happens later. No, something happens later. There's the law of karma. So that is why in the law of karma, we continuously have obligations created for our life. We have to feed ourselves, we have to feed our families, we have to take care of jobs, we have to take care of so many things. They are all obligations imposed on us by the set of karmas which we are paying off. When we talk of seva or meditation, we are talking of finding how much of the proportion of this time we can give. And it should be reasonable, so we also fulfill our karma. Active meditation 
if you give one tenth of your time, is considered to be appropriate. Active donation of wealth seva, if you give 10% of your net income, is considered enough. 10% of meditation time in every 24 hours comes to two and a half hours. Somebody had asked me, why, why is it, what is the significance of two and a half hours? It's the tithe of meditation. The tithe of uh, charity. You are giving it as a part of your spiritual discipline while fulfilling others. But is it enough to just give formal meditation two and a half hours, which is one tenth of total time, and 10% of our net income as charity, we are paying off two kinds of wealth, and 10% of the time, which we can divide because of our work, which we can put up on a holiday, or we can put up on some time when we are free of doing voluntary work. 10% has been considered a reasonable number. But there is one little catch. If you want to give more, you can make a payment of obligations also part of meditation and seva. Supposing you have to do some work. If you say, I am working for myself, it is work. If you say, I am working for master, it becomes seva. Everyday work, including working on your jobs, doing anything. I am cooking food. A master, he is giving it to a family. It's just a thought. It's just an awareness. If you can keep this awareness that everything is being done for master, you are doing 24-hour meditation and 24-hour seva. You can convert your life to that. It's all game of awareness inside. What awareness you hold at all times. So that is why you can make everything that you are doing into meditation by remembering Master, this is what I am doing for Master, this I am doing for Master. Now you have to do those things by obligation. Of course, it's a karmic obligation you are fulfilling, at the same time converting it into meditation and same. So that's the best way one can do. Whole life changes. All attitude changes. When you bring Master into everything, your love for things increases, attachment decreases. Otherwise, the way we live, attachment decreases all the time. By desire and more desire, we increase attachments. But if we say it's for master, attachment decreases. Love for doing that increases, because you love to do it for your master. You may not love to do it for yourself, not to do love for somebody else. But you can do it for your master. Also, when we get a setback in our karmic pattern, that means we get some bad karma, like we have to, we have a loss. People say we lost this thing, it was a big loss, they feel sad. Always remember, it's not a loss, it's a gain. You paid back what you owed. Always. So you can't lose anything, because the karmic pattern is based on this. It's very fair. The karmic pattern is so fair that when you feel you lost something, you got something and which was not yours and you gave it back. So if you start taking your life as a settlement of accounts, the master used to say, life is merely settlement of accounts and learning new lessons, how not to create more accounts. So that's very simple. So. If we start taking every event of our life in, in this way, can you imagine it's a spiritual life all the time, 24-7? Some people ask me, you do tell us to meditate, masters tell us to meditate. Supposing nothing happens. Supposing we are meditating hard and nothing happens, we never see anything, we never see any light, we never hear any sound. Is it worthwhile to go on meditating just like that? If it is not doing anything, why are we meditating? 
that as I hinted earlier, the meditation is yielding something internally. Our karmic obligations can prevent it from becoming visible here. Yeah. I'll give you a true story, important story. My master's master, Baba Jamal Singh, when he was a disciple of his master, Said Shibhyal Singh Swamiji of Agra. Jamal Singh lived in Punjab. And Swamiji lived in another province of India at that time. Quite a distance. Baba Jamal Singh felt one day, he is missing his master so much. He should go and see him. He had an eager salary. He said, I'll save my money. And I will go and see my master. I haven't seen him for a while. I am missing him so much. So to seek the permission of his master, he wrote a letter. He wrote to his master, Beloved master, I am missing you so much. I can't wait. I want to see you as quickly as I can see you. Please give me some time when I can come and see you. Mail was very slow in those days. It took almost a month for a reply to come back. And the master sent a reply, My son Jamal Singh, very happy to know that your soul is roaming around in higher regions. He looked at the letter, he said, My soul is roaming nowhere. This letter must be for somebody else. My mistake mailed to me. So he wrote back. He said, Beloved master, I received a letter, My soul is roaming nowhere. I only wrote to you, I'm missing you so much, I want to have your darshan. I want to see you. Another month, and a letter comes back from his master. I am very happy to know, son Jamal Singh, that you are roaming around in higher Khand Brahman. <laughs> and so far as coming to see me is concerned, you can come in the first week of next month. Armed with these two letters, Jamal Singh travels to Agra and meets his master and says, Master, here are two letters. They were not meant for me. My soul is not roaming anywhere. And in both letters you write that your soul is roaming around in higher regions. So Amiji laughed and said, okay, let's go inside. There were about 10, 15 people sitting there. He said, let's go inside and meditate together. So took Baba Jamal Singh and went inside for about half an hour. After half an hour, they both came out. And Swamiji said, Now tell me, Jamal Singh, when I wrote that letter to you, was your soul roaming around in Khan Brahmand or no? He said, Yes, Master, it was. Then Swamiji said, Now, Jamal Singh, I'm asking you not if your soul was roaming around in the meditation we did. I am asking whether your soul was roaming around two months ago when I wrote that letter. And Jamal Singh says, Yes, Master, it was roaming around at that time. People were a little baffled who were sitting around Swamiji. So Swamiji addressed them. He said, Our spiritual ascent is not always visible to us. Masters put blinders on us so we can't see. And we feel it. Something is happening. We don't understand it. It expresses itself as missing your master. He said the way Chamal Singh was missing, missing his master, could not happen if there was nothing happening inside of the soul. Therefore, do not think that your spiritual progress is only measured by what you see inside. It's measured also by how much you are missing, what kind of devotion is building up, what kind of feelings you have about the master. All these are signs of spiritual progress. It's a great classic example of an example of a, of a gentleman who became master himself. And he's the master of my master. So therefore it's a very significant story. Why do these masters put blinders on us? Because of the karmic obligations we have to fulfill here. We have been placed in charge of jobs, children, families, friends, 
parents, so many things around us. If all the time we are having the spiritual progress, we will delay our obligations and create another life for ourselves. Master don't want that. Masters want you to go back as quickly back to your true home as possible. Therefore, these blinders are put only on the spiritual experience inside taking place. When they show you later, you remember this was happening all the time when I was feeling, I was missing my master so much. I was feeling so much love for him. That was not coming from nowhere except spiritual growth inside. A very important point that one should not worry about why you can't have a spectac spectacle inside. And I tell you the other side, I have met my friends who said, we have seen flying in the sky, we have seen the orange sky, we have gone to such kind. And we are completely now satisfied. We have unshakable faith because of our experience. And next day, their son dies in an accident. Experience counts nothing. Oh, it was all minds made up. Why? How can one say that? If one has had real experience, how can one say this? One can say it because when we come back from experience into physical bodies and physical realities, it becomes physical reality as the only reality. Even experience looks doubtful. Experience is not the best way to judge. An internal experience is not the best way to judge your progress on the spiritual path. More important, what's happening to your feelings of love and devotion for the Master. If that is growing, you are spiritually progressing. It's a very important point because people sometimes think only if I see something, then I will be convinced there is something. But when they see something, maybe it was like a dream. You can't be sure. It's natural for us that when something looks real, when we come back to the physical body, we, there's a question mark on it. It could have just come up from our imagination, could have been, or everything becomes imaginary when we come back to the body. That is why we can lose faith completely by an event taking place in a physical world which we have discovered from there was unreal. Imagine Having gone to a state where we find physical life was made, just made up, it was not real. Illusion. Sure of it. You come back, this becomes absolutely real. That could be just a dream. That experience might have been a dream. This is so important because it is all based upon our constant experience of reality being only at one level. The physical bodies. We are trying to go to our true home when we are in our physical bodies. So, in the physical body, everything is physical is real, nothing else. So, that's why even when we have experiences and we come back from experience, doubts can come in the mind. Doubts are not controlled by an inner experience when you cannot sustain it, when you see it sitting here in the physical body. When can it happen? That you can never have a doubt, no matter what. Only one place, our true home. If you go to our true home, you will find everything is there. Nothing is outside, including the physical world. There you have experience of all and the manner in which it has been created in patterns and levels. That is where if a human being, in a human body, in physical life, has that experience, there, that is the only state of complete unshakable faith. Everything that will happen here will be part of that. Faith will never be shaken. In between, you only have one reality at a one time, you come back to another reality, you come back to physical reality. Because we are trying to get these levels of experience, which are long lasting experiences, when they are there. They have been there for thousands of years, millions of years, experiences sitting inside. You can have them. You can go and see that you were born long ago. So, so many forms. All you can see. Come back here. Would it be real? But this is reality. That's gone. It's inside. Unless you reach the top. Unshakable faith cannot come. 
faith can come. Reasonable faith can come to take you on this journey. But unshakable faith comes only at the top. That is why there are very few people who reach that state. It's meant for those who are real seekers only of that state. We always get what we seek. You seek enlightenment, enlightenment can come at the astral stage. You seek higher enlightenment, depending upon what your definition of enlightenment is. We, there is something intuitive in us which will tell us if we want to go to our true home. And if that seeking is there for true home, a perfect living master is bound to come into our life. That's the arrangement. And when he comes, he's come to take us back home. When does our journey end? Supposing we are seekers, want to go to our true home. When will the journey end? The journey ends the day a perfect living master says, I initiate you. Finished. Your job is done. His job begins. And therefore the master's job is to take you back home. That's the truth. But the mind doesn't accept it. Mind says, then what am I supposed to do? Okay, meditate. Why not? Okay, follow the directions. Be very careful about your diet. Don't eat this, don't do that. All the do's and don'ts come from a mind. Mind says, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Naturally, if I don't do anything, I won't get anything. This is the nature of our mind. Therefore, strictly speaking, meditation is for our mind. Our soul doesn't need any meditation. What does soul need? Soul needs the experience of love of a master. Period. Soul just wants the love of a master and experiences it inside. And the mind has all other needs. How do I do it? What's the best way? Am I doing right? Am I not doing right? Okay. You get all the answers for the mind. And so the meditation course gets fully completed, satisfying the mind. Do it. Master, I can't get any visions. Do more meditation. So the whole thing about soul and mind comes up. The soul is our self. The soul is immortal. Our immortal self is the soul, not the mind. The mind has been given to us. It's a beautiful thing. If you look at it as a soul, you will love the mind. If you look at it sitting in the physical body, I can think it's a terrible thing. We have made a servant given to us into our master. Because we are constantly being guided by his mind telling us what to do. We don't tell the mind. Now mind, this is what I want you to do. We should reverse this and make the mind. Meditation is done by telling the mind what to do. That's what his purpose is. That we are able to tell the mind, don't think of the world, think of these words, think of meditation. So we try to make the mind some, something that is given to us for that purpose. Use the mind, not get used by it. They can be used by the mind. Mind is giving bizarre automatic directions. We just be captured. Mind is creating doubts. Mind is creating fear. Why, is, why do we have doubt of anything? We are constantly doubting things. Why? It was built into the mind. When you have doubt, then you have fear. They are connected as functions of the mind. Mind has been given certain functions. Thinking is his life. The mind has to keep thinking. That's his life for, to survival. It can't stop thinking. There was a... I told this story before, I should tell you again. There was a friend of mine at, in Cambridge, <coughs> Massachusetts, when I was studying there. He was very interested in spirituality, the various kinds of yogas. And his yoga teacher told him, you will get enlightened when you can still your mind. And he showed me books also, that you need stillness of the mind. 
If the mind is not still, you can't realize anything. I read the books, I said, what does stillness of mind mean? Does it mean not thinking? He said, that's what it means. If you are thinking, it's not a still mind. So mind has to stop thinking to be still. I said, have you practiced that yoga? He said, I have, but I can't still it for very long periods. I can stop thinking for short periods. I said, how long can you do it? He said, maximum about half an hour. I can sit in my yogic posture and I can withdraw my attention and stop thinking for half an hour. According to me, he should be dead. If he stops thinking, <laughs> how does he remain alive? So I asked him if he can come to my apartment and demonstrate to me the yogic posture he takes, the asana he adopts, and the method he uses to stop thinking, it will be completely new knowledge for me. And I'll be very impressed with the knowledge if you can demonstrate it. So he came to my apartment and he took up a certain difficult posture of the body. I said, I don't want you to stop thinking half an hour, that's too long. One minute is enough. If you can stop thinking for 60 seconds, I'll be convinced you can do it forever. 60 seconds we will test. I said, when you are ready with your asana and your position in the head, I will give you a clap like this. You stop thinking. I'll keep my eye on my stopwatch. After 60 seconds, I'll give you a second clap to start thinking. Then we will review what happens to consciousness. What happens to awareness when a person is not thinking at all? He said, okay. So he put up his asana and he got ready and I gave a clap. And I waited 60 seconds, gave a second clap and he opened his eyes. He was still alive. <laughs> Much to my surprise. Because I thought if you stop thinking, you die. I said, Let's review what happened in these 60 seconds that you stop thinking. First question, when I clapped, how did you know it's time to stop thinking? Because you're waiting for my clap. I, I said, stop thinking when I clap. So when I clapped, how did you know that's the time to stop thinking? Just recall, don't make up anything. Just remember what actually happened. I remember now, when you clapped, I heard the clap and I said, that is the time to stop thinking. I said, that's a thought according to me. <laughs> if in your head these words came, now is the time to stop thinking, that looks like thought to me. Then I said, how did you know, if I give a second clock, you can start thinking? I said, try to remember, it's only just happened now. It's not trying to figure out how it happened. Remember what happened? He said, I remember. After I said, this is time to stop thinking. When he claps again, I will start thinking again. That thought came to him. I said, that's another thought in your head, like any other thought. How did you stop it? He said, well, that was just a few seconds. I said, all right. How did you continue to? Keep this in mind that when I clap second time, you will start thinking. How did you keep it in mind in your awareness? And he said, oh, I was thinking like that all the time. <laughs> and he put his hand like this. Oh my God, I was thinking more than ever, than I ever thought. Then how did you believe you can stop thinking? What made you think that you stop thinking? And he said, I really don't know. I said, I'll explain to you. You don't know, I'll explain it to you. The mind does not think in one channel. The mind thinks in several channels. You feel you are not thinking. The mind is commenting upon it in another channel. You are only halting the mind from one channel. And the comments that came, which you did not even hear, you thought you really stopped thinking. 
the comments I reminded you when I said look back and remember. The comments that you coming up with, second layer. My things in many layers. I give you example. We say do your meditation, your simran, your mantra with your mind. You repeat the word with your mind. You can at the same time say, am I repeating too fast? Is it the right way? Who's that? Also the mind. The mind comments upon what the first level of thinking is. The mind can comment upon second level of thinking. Third level of thinking. I met a holy Buddhist man who could go up to eight levels and he realized it during meditation. Most of us use three, four levels anyway. We use three, four channels of the mind. One is the immediate one, others are a little subtle and therefore we can recognize what we are doing with the middle one. Now that raises another question. If you are repeating the mantra and thinking you are doing Simran, have you ever watched that you are also thinking about top of that? Have you watched the words of the Simran and the mantra ringing in you and you can hear them on top of it you can hear in a slightly thinner voice Am I doing this? Have I done that? When will I finish it? Is it time to finish? Where are those words coming from? Also thoughts. The, the higher level thoughts destroy the value of the lower thoughts. It's not good simran. Now I'm going to tell you how to do good simran. Good simran is, good repetition of mantra is, when you notice that you are using this word to repeat, you can also hear some comment made the commentator repeat the words alongside. So you'll hear two voices repeating. If there's still a comment going on, three voices. What does the mind do? When you try this trick, you will find the mind will try to then present an image, a friend's image, somebody else's image. And the image will start speaking, you are doing the repetition. The words of the person speaking are also your mind's words. Therefore, make that person also join in the repetition. Twenty figures come up, all twenties repeating the words. Good Simran is when all voices in the head are doing Simran together. It, it feels like many voices doing it. One voice of the mind is not enough for good meditation. Every voice that you can get in the head should be doing it. That is effective similar. Shall we try? Let's try. When you are repeating the words now, see if there is a commentator sitting also speaking in the head. Let two voices repeat at the same time. If you hear a third, yours or an image, let it join also. If it's a big chorus of similar going on, it's good. All doing at the same time. That's where the tension will be pulled up. Close your eyes, go to the meditation center. Start repeating the words slowly and listening to them. Any other sound that you come, any other voice that you come, make it join the repetition. Do not stop the repetition. Let the second thought also join at the same time.
Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Welcome back. How many of you could successfully hear more than boy, one voice and put both of them to say? Very good. That is the way to take advantage of repetition of the mantra. Because the mind can use other channels to take you again back to the distracting thoughts of this world. So use this method. All the steps that I have mentioned to you, the mental mechanical steps, it will take you up to the causal plane. And the doing of meditation with love and devotion will take you beyond the mental plane. The responsibility for going beyond the mind is not yours. Because you can't do anything. The responsibility is the one who pulls you with love. A perfect living master pulls you with love. It is immense love, which is unmeasurable from the mind and the mental states to spiritual states, to your own state of being the soul. The same power, the same master power which is doing, able to do that, exercises in a smaller scale, even in the form of a human being when he is here. A master, a perfect living master, will always have that unconditional love for you which pulls you. Nothing is greater than the pull of a perfect living master to love. People ask me, there are so many masters, which one should I follow? I said, follow the one that pulls you. Where he will take you? Where he is gone. Where will he take you? Where you want to go. You want to go to heaven, he'll take you to heaven. If he has gone to heaven. If he hasn't gone to heaven, he can't do anything. Then he's just a fake master, just teaching something which he can't do. Therefore, a master takes you up to the point where your seeking is. If you seek to go to your true home, which is really our spiritual destination, a perfect living master will come in your life by coincidence, by chance, without your knowing how he came into my life, he will appear. And as you get to know a human being, like other human beings we come to know, you get to know that human being, you gradually discover he is more than a mere human being. He is operating from somewhere else. He knows my thought before I think of them. He can give me guidance on things that I wonder how he is doing it. If you ask him some question about what you think he has already indicated to you, he'll say, I don't know anything. These perfect living masters live exactly like us and they don't display their powers. They are so humble, they never display their powers. They never perform public miracles on the streets. But they perform several miracles in our life on a daily basis when they initiate us. These perfect living masters never claim to be masters. No perfect living master ever claimed to say, I am a master. That brings in like an ego game. And they don't have that kind of ego to claim something. What are they claiming for? When they know this is an unreal world, we are trapped into it, we have to go to a real world. What they try to claim to say something like that. Therefore, they have never claimed. Great master was asked, are you a master? He said, of course not. I am a slave of my master. And then he put a question to the questioner. Have you read Guru Granth Sahib? the Sikh scripture, Guru Nanak, the founder of the religion, whose name has been used in the writings of all the different Gurus, right up to the fifth Guru who compiled the Guru Granth Sahib, 
Have you ever read Guru Nanak says, I am a master? Anyway, you read, he calls himself Dasan Das. I am the slave of the slaves. I am the servant of the servants. I am doing seva for the seva Das. That's the extent of humility these perfect living masters have. Therefore, you cannot judge a master just because he is like an ordinary human being and associates. The secret is the pull that comes from the dog. I, I give the definition. Till you know who is a master, whoever pulls you, follow. Up to the point where you are seeking is. One friend of mine wrote to me, I have three, four masters who I visit, but I am not sure who is the real one. Can you tell me who is the real one? I can give you a list of the four masters. Can you just point out? Just do this favor. Tell me who is the real one. I said, I don't I have never commented upon other masters. I know not, it's not my job. It's not my role to be judging masters. I have come to do seva for my masters. That's all. I have no role in judging anybody at all. So therefore, I can't say who is good or not good or fake or real. All I can say is, Follow the master who pulls you with his love. He wrote back to me, two of them are pulling me. <laughs> I said, you are very lucky if people don't find one, you found two. Follow any one of them. And then you will find out where he can take you. Masters take you up to where they have gone. But they, since they have had that experience, they all call it the ultimate truth. They all call it such kind. It's a true home. Just because their experience is there, they teach the same and take us. Supposing you get initiated by a master who is not a perfect living master, but you thought he was, so you get initiated. How will you know that he was not a perfect living master? Because with all your association with that master, at a point will come when you say, I haven't got all I was seeking. I was seeking more than this. When that happens, you are ready for another master. It does not mean that you only have one master. We have several masters in our lifetime. According to our scriptures, everybody has four masters. One, the mother, with the first teacher. Our first master is the mother when you are born. And then is the school teacher, then is the priest in the, our temple or church or wherever we go, then it's a spiritual master. So we have four in any case, and among spiritual masters we can have many. Does it matter if you have more than one master? Not at all. It's a progression. We ourselves go through a progression of our seeking and progression of the life, proper masters coming into our life. They come by chance at the stage at which we are. So, I, I can tell you a few stories of people who found a master. I have told this story earlier many times. True story of a friend of ours. An engineer working in Burma, a country now called Myanmar. His name was Trilok Chak very good friend of our family and very good friend of mine. I remember him a lot. Good friend, as a good friend. Why he became so friendly with me was because I was willing to accompany him the evening after his friendly day during the day to his house where his wife was waiting for him. He was so afraid of his wife. He needed moral support. <laughs> and he would take me and say, you stand in front. <laughs> so I still remember. And she would shout loud at him and I would take the shout. And he came from back. I was with him. I was with him. So I still remember those incidents. It happened more than once. But this Tadloksha was a great seeker of the truth. He would meet every holy man who came to Rangoon and to Mamio where he worked in two places in Burma and tried to get more 
knowledge, but he was never fully satisfied. Then he heard that there is a Swami in Madras in India. It's now called Chennai. The city is now called Chennai. Then called Madras. That in Madras in South India, there is a Swami who can give true knowledge. He said that's what he want. So he wound up his business. He sold everything. And he gathered 30,000 rupees, which was his whole wealth. And with 30,000 rupees, he came to India, went to the Swami. And Swamiji, I have heard that you can give true knowledge. I have come for true knowledge. Swamiji said, have you heard the story of King Janak? Same story I told you earlier. He said, yes, Master, I have heard. He said, I follow the principle of Ashtavakar. Give me your wealth, give me your body, give me your mind, I'll give you true knowledge. Now, the doctor said, I am no less than King Janan. I give you everything. My body is yours, my wealth is yours, my mind is yours. Now give me true knowledge. Swamiji said, let's start with wealth. How much do you have? <laughs> he said, in all my life I collected, I have with me 30,000 rupees. He said, first step, deposit your 30,000 rupees in my account tomorrow. I have to start building a temple. Imagine the Lokchan, how he saved that money as a simple engineer working on the road. It was because he was very tight with money, always spending very little. He used to, like Hamlet and Shakespeare, he would take out one rupee note one bill of one rupee and say, to spend it or not to spend it? <laughs> and not to spend it. Back in the pocket. <laughs> Imagine that kind of man gave away his 30,000 rupees to the Swami the next day. Then Swamiji said, now you give your body to me and I need the body to perform a surgery in your mouth because the method of meditation I will teach is a breathing exercise in which you have to breathe alternately. One breath taken from the right nostril, one from the left nostril and continuously change. No fingers to be used because they will draw your attention out. It has to be done within. Only the tongue has to be used. The tongue has to be pushed back and from inner orifices of the nose. You have to grow, control your breathing once here, once here. And that's my method of meditation. My teacher also, my Swami also taught me the same thing. And the Swami opened his mouth, his tongue came out like a snake. <laughs> Completely free of the tendons below. Then Lokshan went through a torture of getting the tendons moved, not with a surgical operation, but with sandpaper, some kind of a sandpaper he used. In fact, sometimes they use a nettle rash, a plant. It is so stingy, painful. He said, it's paining too much. He said, pain is necessary. No pain, no gain. You will not get anything if you are not willing to sacrifice. He went through torture for a month and he turned the gummies. And he could then turn the tongue around and learn the method of meditation. The master said, now give your mind and I will teach you how to repeat words of mantra that I will give you while you are breathing, alternately. This is true pranayam, true breath yoga. So he taught him how to breathe like this and how to use it. And the Lokcham told us when he came that he had some experience of lights and some things, colors and lights, but nothing what he called true knowledge. So he said, Master Swamiji, I have got some experience, but it's not true knowledge. I want to know who am I? I have seen things, but not known who is seeing it. I want to know who is seeing it. Swamiji said, my path ends here. I can give you no more. If you want more, you have to find somebody else. So the Lokcham left the Swami, traveled again after his journey. He found great master. 
Abba Salman Singh <clears throat> got initiated from him. Made very rapid progress because he was already practicing concentration. One day, we were all sitting around Great Master in the evening. It was a very small crowd in those days. It was not a very huge place. The monthly satsang, weekly satsang Great Master used to give was attended by 20 people. And the monthly satsang, 25. Big Bandara, 29th of December, which was the day when his master passed away. For the Grand Bandara, 200 people. And he would give prashad to 200 people who attended the Bandara. Personally, he had him over. Small group used to sit together and the Rokchan spoke up. He said, Master, had I known you will give me true knowledge and this wealth, I would not have given those 30,000 rupees to the Swamiji. His mind was still on the 30,000. <laughs> the great master laughed and said, The Rokchan, you don't know. The day you came to me, I transferred those 30,000 to my account. <laughs> and then he explained to all of us, he says, no matter which master you follow, it's part of the journey, spiritual journey. When you will find a perfect living master, all that you have done with any master counts and all accumulates and great masters, perfect living masters take that into account. Nothing is ever lost. You can't say, oh, I went to the wrong master, therefore I lost time. No, it all counts. The spiritual journey is in these steps and it comes up like that. Therefore, never bother about that. Oh, I went to a master, he didn't give me much, but he gave you what he could. He gave you not only what he could, he gave you what you needed at that time. And that is why you moved on. This is a spiritual path, which is progressive. Progressively you go. And that is why you can make advances in one lifetime and go to a higher region. Not complete your journey, which you want to complete, you die. Your karma ended. You made only half the journey. You are reborn again to complete the journey. When you are born again, you don't start from where you left off. You start from the beginning again, but rapidly, more rapidly than last time. So you are able to catch up quickly at an early age and then move on faster. It's a progressive thing. And therefore, these are all working automatically, these things. And we should not worry too much of the who we followed the master, did he take us there, was he real, unreal. Even unreal masters have performed their role, what they had to do for you. They responded to you. It is the masters are perfect living masters take into account everything that you've gone through. It's simple. They never say, oh, you wasted your time. No time is ever wasted on the spiritual path no matter which master you are following. But if your seeking is for the true home beyond the mind, a perfect living master will come into your life when you are ready for it. We'll break here at this time. I'll meet you tomorrow again for our final session in the morning 11 o'clock. So thank you very much for joining me. Good night and try this meditation tonight. Who will try tonight? I check it out tomorrow. <laughs>